Before we say the Torah portion, we always have a blessing over the Torah portion. And before we do the Hof Torah, there's a separate blessing that I'd like to teach you. I've translated it into English, so at least you know what you're saying. But we can say it together. Praise to you, Adonai our God, sovereign of the universe, who has chosen faithful prophets to speak words of truth. Praise to you, Adonai, for the revelation of Torah, for your servant Moses, for your people Israel, and for prophets of truth and righteousness. This is read in Hebrew every Shabbat morning in the synagogues before they go into the second part of the service, which is the Hof Torah, which is what we're going to now go into. The Hof Torah is the prophets section that was allowed to be read during the time of the Greek oppression of Jerusalem when they forbid the study of Torah. So the Jews were inspired by God to preserve the stories of Torah, even when they couldn't read it publicly, by finding common parallel themes in the prophets' writings. And so this is what I like to bring out to share with you. A lot of times we study the Torah portion, but we don't have enough time to really go into depth on in how the prophets parallel the Torah portion. And that's what I'm going to share with you today and each week for the next year. So this morning's Torah portion is called Shalach, and it's actually sometimes called Shalach Lecha, means sin forth for yourself. And God is telling Moses to send forth spies, to spy out the land of Canaan that he's going to give. This was the original inheritance of Shem, and Canaan had usurped that against his father Noah's wishes. And so Moses is picking one from each tribe to go and represent all of Israel to see how good this land is that God has already prepared for them. He had the Canaanites build up houses and plant vineyards and it was a land flowing with milk and honey that they could literally walk right into and the produce was ready in the land and the houses were already built and they had to do nothing. God would have sent them out and the giants with a horde of bees he says in the scriptures if Israel would have only had faith. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning is this common theme of faith where Israel failed they went into the land and they saw how good the land was and everything that God said was true. But because of the fear, and fear comes from a lack of love and faith. Remember the scriptures tell us perfect love casts out all fear. They came back and they said, yes, the land is beautiful, but we fear the giants. And we're afraid that we will be like grasshoppers and they'll just trample us and we'll be nothing to them. And so... Because of this lack of faith, they were destined to wander in the wilderness another 39 years. This was only one year into after they left Exodus. God was going to give them the land after only one year of going through the wilderness. And that's like us in our life. What giants are in our life that block our view from seeing the blessings that God wants to pour out on us? And then we're destined to spin around, you know, in life, so to speak. For years, we try to restore the years the locust has eaten, but we can't do it. Only God can do it. And it will only happen when we realign ourselves through faith with His Word. By faith, taking the land or whatever it is that He's promised to give us. Us. This is what he desires, that we would not lose out on the blessings. So the Hoftor portion in the prophets, we're going to look at Joshua chapter 2. And you're going to see 40 years later, 39 actually, because they're already one year in. Now it's 39 years later, they've been wandering around. And God said, none of this generation will enter the land, except for the two men out of the 12 that spoke the truth, Joshua and Caleb. So now we pick up years later. Joshua is from the tribe of Ephraim, and Caleb is from the tribe of Judah. And they are now the last two, and Joshua is going to take the leadership role where Moses died on the other side of the Jordan, and Moses could not bring the Israelites into the land. Joshua was set up to bring them into the land. And after we read this Torah portion about this beautiful story of how Joshua sends spies into the land before they're going to enter it and how they bring back a good report and they're full of faith, we're going to see parallels of Moses and Yeshua as well as Joshua and Yeshua. Yeshua's first coming is very much like Moses and Yeshua's second coming will be very much like Joshua. In Yeshua's first coming, he couldn't regather the lost house of Israel back to the land because there was a lack of faith in the land. 
You notice how many of the rulers did not receive him. And so they were destined to wander for 40 jubilees. It's been 2,000 years. Just like the children of Israel wandered for 40 years because of their lack of faith, our people have had a lack of faith that's caused a delay in the kingdom being established on this earth. So we're going to see some prophetic significance this morning after we read the book of Joshua. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Joshua chapter 2, and this morning's Haftor is the whole chapter, uh, just chapter 2. And there's so many beautiful lessons in this story of these spies going into Jericho. It's the first city after they cross the Jordan, and how they go to this inn that's run by this harlot named Rahab. And we're going to see so many beautiful spiritual lessons that come out of this. You know, in the time of Moses, it was disbelief in God's word that he would give them the land that caused them to wander and to lose out on that blessings. And that was about 1416 BC. That was 2,400 years and 10 years after creation. And then you fast forward down to the time where Nebuchadnezzar besieges Jerusalem in 586, and it was disbelief in God's word that led to their disobedience that led them to lose that blanket protection of God. So every time, whether you're looking at physical blessings, spiritual blessings, protection, health and wellness, it's not a curse from God. It's a natural cause and effect of our own disobedience and lack of faith. And so we will apply this to our own lives as we now look at the story of Joshua the son of Nun, sending, this time, not 12 spies, but two. Very interesting, because what you're going to find is there's a parallel there as well between Yeshua's first coming and second coming. And Nun in Hebrew is a letter of the alphabet which means life. It looks like a seed in the Paleo-Hebrew. And so literally, here's a representation of Joshua in Hebrew is pronounced Yehoshua, and this is how you'd actually pronounce Jesus' true name in Hebrew, or Yeshua, we, it's a kind of a shortened version of Yehoshua. So they actually have the same name, which means Yah's salvation. And here Joshua is called the son of life in Hebrew. And Yeshua is the son of the source of life. So there's an amazing parallel. And he secretly sends out two spies now. Interesting. He was there for 39 years before, when Moses had sent him out with 11 others, and only him and Caleb brought back a true report. This time, he only sends out two instead of 12, which is interesting. And we're going to look at this parallel. These two people, even though the Torah or the Hoff Torah does not tell you, they were Pincus or Phineas. This was the grandson of Aaron son of Eliezer, the high priest. And Caleb, once again, was a spy because he proved worthy. And Joshua, as the warrior leader, is staying back to, to take care of Israel. And he sends two of these spies from Shedem with these instructions, go and inspect the land and Jericho. So they left and they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab. Now, a lot of times in these ancient walled cities, you would have a woman who would be an innkeeper. So to go to a harlot's house was not meaning that there was any wrongdoing or that there was any intent to do wrong or that they would associate normally with harlots. It's just that this type of women were the ones to run the inns for wayfarers, for strangers in the town. So it's actually an innkeeper type. And they spend the night there. And the king of Jericho was told about it. Tonight, some men from Israel came here to reconnoissure the land. Now, the king had heard about Israel and all the wonderful exploits that God had done, from the parting of the Red Sea to them conquering the giants uh, Og and, of Bashan, and uh, everyone was afraid. And from our studies in the afternoon, when we study the book of Jasher, and you see the amazing battles that the 12 sons of Jacob fought against different cities of giants, it was incredible, the supernatural power and strength that attended them. So they had had not just the last 39 years of stories, but they had had the last 250 years of stories and more of these sons of Jacob who were so powerful, and now they're right on their border. So the king of Jericho sent a message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and are staying in your house because they have come to spy out all the land. However, this Canaanite woman, this harlot, after taking the two men, 
in, she realized there was something godly about them. And she realized the truth of the one true God of Israel. And so she hides them instead of giving them up. And she replied, a little white lie, you might say. Yes, the men did come to me, but I didn't know where they had come from. The men left around the time when they shut the gate, when it was dark. So these cities would have the gates open during the day, and strangers and travelers and merchants could travel in and out of the city of Jer Jericho and other walled cities like this. Jericho was just one of many walled cities. And at dusk, they would shut the gates for protection. And here she is hiding these two spies from Israel, and she's lying about it. But God honors her in this because we know from Torah to preserve life trumps all, right? And she's preserving these godly men. And she says, where they went, I don't know. But if you chase after them quickly, you will probably overtake them. So she gets the soldiers focused outside of the city gate, knowing that the gates are just about to be closed and they'll be stuck out there for the night. So they rush out trying to catch up with them. Actually, she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them under some stalks of flax that she had spread out there. The men pursued them all the way to the fords of the Jordan River. As soon as the pursuit party had left, the gate was shut. Now the two men had not yet lain down when she returned to the roof and told them, I know that Yahavah has given you the land. This is like her proclamation of faith. She is actually confessing faith in yod heh vav -Heh, and in the fact that he had promised to give the land not to Canaan and their descendants, but to Israel and their descendants. So this is very important, this verse 9. You see Rahab not only acting out, love is always a verb and it's an action. And her faith was put into action, just like our faith is to be put into action. When we hear God's word, we're not just to be hearers, but we're to be doers. She hid them and then she professes, I know that yod heh vav -Heh has given you the land. Fear of you has fallen on us. Everyone in the land is terrified at the thought of you. We've heard how Adonai drop, dried up the water in the Red Sea ahead of you when you left Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Emirai. These Emirai were uh, offspring of the giants. So this one king was Og and his, uh, he was about 16 feet tall. They knew of these stories, how they had conquered them on the other side of the Jordan. And here it names them. Sihon was one king of the Emirai and Og, Og of Bashan, we learn in the Torah and that you completely destroyed them. As soon as we heard it, our hearts failed us. Because of you, everyone is in a state of depression. Interesting, how many times do we fear something? And when we lose our hopelessness, we fall into a state of depression. Without hope, people lose all hope. Without trusting God, without knowing his care. And you know, this is the problem in the world today. They don't have any hope. Hello, little friend. <laughs> We've got a little creation here with us. Uh-oh. This week, we've seen two suicides in the news. BBC did a big article on the rise in suicide because people are full of fear. Just like it says here, their hearts are failing them. They're in a state of depression. Fear and hopelessness will always lead to people not being able to see past their immediate situation. And I don't know if you heard, but there's a, a designer lady named Kate Spade who took her own life. And then Anthony Bourdain, the chef, took his own life, both just this week. And in 2016 alone, there was about 45,000 suicides in the U.S. alone, not to mention the world. Yes, Terrence. There was a young man um, here at the Anti High School who was laughing and took his own Oh, no, the same week. There's some kind of darkness or oppression. That is so sad to hear. Do you know since 2000, suicide rates are up 30%, and yet it's never talked about. This is because people have lost the hope. Without God, there is no hope for a future or for blessings. Their immediate gratification society is such that when they lose whatever material things they're attached to, their identity is so tied into that 
that they think there's no reason to continue living. And how sad that is. That's why we love to not only are you most likely a descendant of Israel, or you're, you can be grafted into Israel and receive the same promises, but even more so, your true identity is in the Spirit of God within you. And that gives all of us hope, to know that you are selfless love, and you are selfless love, and the same Spirit that's in me is in you, and that makes us one in Him. And there's such hope for living in eternity in that unity and that love. But without that, the world is just wandering in darkness. And so here we see all of Jericho. They're just frightened to death because they had no hope compared to seeing the blessings that God had poured out on Israel. And they were in a state of depression, Rahab says. And here's the reason. She says, For Yahweh, your God, He is God in heaven above and on the earth below. This is an amazing proclamation for a pagan woman. Because in pagan times, there were gods of wealth, there was God of heaven, there was God of earth, God of the sea, there was God of destruction, God of creation. There was different gods for all these purposes. But when she says, your God is the God of heaven and earth, she's making an amazing proclamation, a recognition that he's the one and only true God, that all these others are just counterfeit and idols. So, she goes on, Please swear to me by yod heh vav -He, that since I've been kind to you, you will also be kind to my father's family. Give me some evidence of your good faith. And we're talking about faith here this morning. We're going to see it in not only Moses' spies' lack of faith, but in the faith that Rahab had and the faith that Joshua and Caleb had and their spies. She says, Give me a testimony of your good faith that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers and sisters, and all who are theirs, so that we won't be killed. The men replied to her, our lives are certainly worth yours, provided you don't betray our mission. So when Adonai gives us the land, we will treat you kindly and in good faith. So then she lowered them by a rope through the window. Her dwelling place, her inn, was in this huge wall. They had dwelling places, the walls were so wide. So she had one with a window that looked out to the outer, outside the city walls. And she lowered them down through with a rope. And she told them, head for the hills. It's very interesting how there's a little hidden message even in when there's a time of trouble. There is a time to be a witness in the city, but there's also a time to head for the hills. The only way we will know which is which is if the Spirit of God, is, if we're listening with spiritual ears to hear how the Spirit's going to lead us. We all have different callings and different purposes. And there's going to be a time for witnesses to witness in Jerusalem. And there's going to be a time for God's people to be hidden in the wilderness, in the hills. So the only way we will know is if we are listening to the Spirit of God. She told them, head for the hills so that the pursuit party won't get their hands on you and hide yourself there for three days until the pursuers have returned. After that, you can go on your way. The men said to her, we will not be guilty of violating the oath you made us swear, provided when we enter the land, you tie this piece of scarlet cord in the window you let us down from, and you gather together in your house your father, mother, brothers, and father's entire household. If anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, he will be responsible for his own blood, and we will be guiltless. But everyone who stays with you in this house, we they will be saved. We will not be responsible for his blood if anyone lays a hand on him. No, we will, he says. If they're in your house, we will be responsible for his blood if anyone lays a hand on him. However, if you say a word about this business of ours, then that you made us swear. According to your words, so be it, she said, and sent them away. As they departed, she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Very interesting, scarlet cord. This is very symbolic as well. They left, and they arrived in the hills, and as she had told them, they stayed there for three days. It's interesting that during the time of trouble, which is three and a half years, there will be people hidden in the hills. And a day is like a year. When God meets out prophecy, he often uses a day for a year principle. So there's symbolism even here. 
and they stayed there until the pursuers had returned. The pursuers had searched for them all the way, but hadn't found them. Then the two men returned. Descending from the hills, they crossed over and came to Yehoshua, the son of Nun, and reported everything that had happened to them. This time, there's no negative report. There's no lack of faith. This time, Israel is ready to take the land, and they speak with conviction and with power that, yes, we can take the land. And this is what has happened. They said, truly, Adonai has handed over all the land to us. Amazing statement of faith, a positive message of belief. Everyone in the land is terrified that we are coming. So there's quite a few correlations that we can bring between Moses and his 12 spies and Joshua and his two spies. In the story of Rahab, we see that God isn't concerned with how bad her past is. She is making a profession of faith and living out that profession in doing the right thing. And so God meets it to her as righteousness. And you're going to find out who Rahab ends up becoming and the blessings that attended her because of this act of faith. Faith in the true God changes us. We can have an enduring legacy no matter who we are, where we've come from, what sins we've committed, as long as we repent. And in Hebrew, repentance means to turn back to the source. When she acknowledged yod heh vav -Hey, she was turning back to the source. That was her confession and repentance, her teshuva. Now, there's some interesting scriptures that go even in the New Testament and talk about Rahab's amazing faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30 and 31, it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who acted disobediently because she received the spies with peace. So here's another principle, recognizing the people of God and blessing them, just like God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will allow to be cursed. And so Rahab, by meeting them with peace and by blessing them, by hiding them, God blesses her. And she ends up becoming the grandmother of King David. Do you know it was Boaz's uh, grandmother that Rahab, she ended up marrying Salmon, uh, Boaz's father. James 2.25 says, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? So we often talk about the amazing justification that we experience through Yeshua and his sacrifice on the cross. But that's not going to lead you to eternal life without justification by works. Everybody's freely justified. The whole world was reconciled to God through what Yeshua did. But are they all going to receive it? Are they all going to accept it? Are they all going to let it li live out? his word, a return to his word. Justification is separate from justification by works. James says, faith without works is dead. So when you really know that somebody is truly faithful, it's because the fruits of the Spirit and uh, living in harmony with God's word accompanies that faith. So here they even mention that Rahab the harlot was justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. We often quote the latter part of this verse without realizing that it's in reference to Rahab and her faith that worked. Matthew 1 and Luke 3 give us two lineages. Matthew 1 is the lineage of Joseph. Luke 3 is the lineage of Mary. These are the parents of Yeshua. And they both had the same lineage up to King David. Where their lineage separates is from King Solomon. Mary came through the line of Natan, the other son of David, and Joseph came through Solomon. But Solomon had some wicked descendants who God said, none of their descendants will ever sit on the throne. So Yeshua couldn't be the blood relative of Joseph because his lineage was prophesied not to be fit for a future king. And Yeshua is the future king of the kingdom. So he comes only through Mary and his heavenly father, and her lineage is pure through David's son Nathan. But they both have the same um, family tree before David. And look at the family tree. It includes Rahab. Matthew 1, verse 5 and 6 says, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, 
So she wasn't only grafted into Israel and saved from Jericho, but she intermarried. Once you're grafted into Israel, do you know that even when people convert to Judaism, no Jewish rabbi will ever question your past, your upbringing, your nationality. You are Israel. You are Jewish from thenceforth. And so same way with Rahab. You can intermarry then and within the family of Israel. And she married Salmon. And they had a son named Boaz, who ends up marrying another Gentile, Ruth, who's grafted in. So Boaz learned the beautiful principle about the sincere heart of a grafted in person because his own mother was a grafted in person. This is why he's open minded to marrying Ruth, where the other guy who was closer to her kinsmen and had first right to marry her was not willing to marry her. He's thinking, oh, she's a Moabite. I don't want anything to do with a Moabite. But Boaz, through the Spirit of God, recognized, and because of that, their offspring is King David and Yeshua. Both ladies, amazing, beautiful. Boaz, the father of Obed, who's the father of David, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. This is what your faith can enact, not only in your own life, in the restoration of blessings, but in your children's progeny. And long-lasting, generation after generation, one right decision to be grafted into Israel will bless you and your future generations. So to now go back and look kind of with eagle eyes or through God's eyes, the amazing depth of Torah and its multiple layers, if you parallel the Torah portion with this Hoff Torah, you see some amazing examples of Yeshua coming out. And you know when Yeshua taught the disciples, it says he expounded to them everything concerning himself from the scriptures. This means there's no scripture that you can't see a hidden glimpse of Messiah Yeshua, the Word of God made flesh. And so we're going to see it both in the Torah portion and in the Hoff Torah. Look at some of these similarities. Moses, here he has this amazing miracle with water, the Red Sea parting, right? We know Yeshua walked on the water. Moses was a meek and humble suffering servant and a prophet. Yeshua in his first coming was a suffering servant and a prophet. Moses sent forth 12 to Israel, right? The 12 spies, Yeshua picked 12, and he sent them to the lost house of Israel in all the lands of their dispersion. Moses did not bring kol Yisrael. Kol means all. Yisrael is the nation. He could not bring the whole three million people into the land. As much as he desired it and as much as he pleaded with God and as righteous as he was, this is very similar to Yeshua's first coming. It had a purpose as the suffering servant and as the prophet, but he wasn't meant to bring Israel into the land at that time. One of the clear distinctions of a Messiah is that not only will he rebuild the temple and set up his kingdom, but he has to return the exiles of Israel. This is why Judah will not recognize Yeshua yet. But when Yeshua comes back and he does catch up the exiles and returns them to the land, they will receive him. And it says the spirit of grace and, and supplication will be poured out upon them and they will mourn, recognizing, whoa, he was the one that came the first time. We just didn't see that all these prophecies would be fulfilled in two different comings. And it says they mourn as one mourns for a firstborn child. So Hebrews 11 verse 27 says, It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt. Once again, it's all about faith. Without faith, even the children of Israel wouldn't be delivered. You know, even before Moses, it was the faith of the Hebrew righteous women that caused deliverance to occur within Israel. It says that the women were so righteous within Israel that it was because of the wives that Israel was delivered by their faith. Not fearing the king's anger, Moses kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who's invisible. What a beautiful lesson for us. We have to keep our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith. There's going to be so many times where situations change and we can get caught up in the situation and we can become reactionary when somebody does something that we don't like or does something against us. But like Moses, let us keep, and Yeshua, our eyes on the invisible one, the Holy One of Israel. And then God will be able to do amazing things through us if we will keep our eyes on Him. We only stumble like Peter walking on the water. When you look down, you take your eyes off the source, then you sink. And we see some amazing parallels there in our own lives.
there's a prophecy that God gave Moses at the end of his life to encourage him. Even though you're not going to take Israel into the land, Moses, I'm going to send a prophet from one of your own brethren. So he's going to be from Israel. In the future, I'm going to send somebody who's going to speak my word. He's going to be a prophet like you. The Lord said to Moses, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak unto them all that I shall command him. So Yeshua is the Word made flesh with the Word of God on his tongue. And he doesn't take people away from the Word of God, from the Torah. He is the living embodiment of what Torah looks like, lived out in love, even laying down his life. Total selfless love is the character of God. And everything that God commands him, he will speak. This is why Yeshua says, my words are not my own. They're from the Father. He knew and recognized himself as the fulfillment of this prophecy. And so he couldn't even take credit for his own words. That's how selfless he was, dying daily to self. But with Moses, you know, they were a mixed multitude. So there were thousands of Egyptians that came too. You know, in Egypt. They were grafted in too. Yes, yeah, so, you follow my word, follow my ways, and follow my commandments. And they received the blessings. Even Pharaoh's daughter converted, and her name was changed to Batya, which but means daughter of Yah. What I'm trying to say. Well, there, it's, it is Israel. Once you're grafted in, it is Israel. You should get out of this mindset of thinking I'm American, or I'm this religion, or I'm this color. If you're grafted in, you're part of Israel. Embrace it. No longer do you say I'm Egyptian, or I'm Moabite, or I'm from Jericho. <laughs> and the word judge is not in the word. That's right. Verse 19 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will hearken unto my words, which he shall speak, this is speaking of Yeshua, I will require it of him. Whosoever will not hearken to God's word spoken through Yeshua, it's going to be required of them. This is serious language. There's many people who may hold on to Torah, but not recognize the words of the Father through Yeshua. This was written about 1,570 years, even before Yeshua's coming. So this is a long-term prophecy pointing to the Word. So look at these parallels with Moses and, and Yeshua's first coming. Yeshua was a meek, humble servant to the point where he laid down his own life. And he was a prophet. And all religions around the world, even Islam, recognizes Yeshua as a prophet. Even Jews recognize Jesus as a prophet, Yeshua. Why don't they recognize him as Messiah? Because he hasn't fulfilled the prophecies pertaining to the king, the anointed one, who will establish his kingdom and return the exiles yet. That's to be in his second coming. Moses sent forth 12 to Israel. Yeshua sent forth 12 to Israel. Moses could not bring Israel into the land at that time. Yeshua's first coming wasn't about bringing Israel back to the land at that time and setting up his kingdom. He sent diplomats, ambassadors, if you will, 12 of them to the lost house of Israel in all the countries where they were residing. At that time, predominantly throughout, you know, from north of the Caucasus to uh, north and west to Europe. So some of them went to Spain. Some of them, Paul went to uh, London, Great Britain area. Um, Thomas went to India. Um, you see Matthew staying back, and his message was predominantly to, to help Jews recognize that he is the fulfillment of these prophecies, but that it's not going to all be in one coming, that he would ascend to heaven and that he would return. They, he, Matthew was really speaking to a Jewish audience and wanting the Jews to recognize him. So he stayed there. Um, John went to Rome and uh, ended up being exiled to Patmos. And you can just see the 12 being scattered out to collect Israel, to prepare them, and to encourage them. Like we talked about the lack of faith and hopelessness. If Israel had not heard that these prophecies had been fulfilled, they may have lost hope and lost all sense of their own identity in these foreign lands. And then they would have never woken up. But just the fact that 2,000 years ago there was ambassadors sent to the lost house of Israel was enough to create a revival that ended up looking like Christianity. Unfortunately, in the process, much Torah because of the Roman Catholic Church, and they're quick to um, come after the scene. The original apostles taught Torah with a testimony of Yeshua, a faith that does work. But the, because of the Roman Catholic Church and their oppression through the Dark Ages, there was this change in believers where they only believed, but Torah was burnt. 
they went through the synagogues and took out the scrolls in Spain and in um, Italy and all across Europe. So we see this amazing correlation between Moses and Yeshua. And just like Moses and Joshua were 40 years apart, Yeshua's first coming and his second coming are 40 jubilees apart. So now we see different areas that Yeshua fulfilled in his first coming. He was a prophet like unto Moshe. Deuteronomy 18 we read, Acts 3 confirms it. He's called the Son of Man that Daniel saw in vision that would rule um, for his father in the Millennial Kingdom. John 3 and John 5, he's referred to as the Son of Man. He's referred to as the Suffering Servant in Isaiah 49 verses 5 through 7 and Isaiah 53 and Luke 2, 30. He even refers to himself as the Son of Man or as to a Suffering Servant. And he's also recognized as the Lamb of God that the Pesach Lamb pointed forward to. In Leviticus 1.10 and Leviticus 3.6 and 14.10, John 1.29 and 1 Peter 1.18 and 19. So these are the areas that you can see he's like Moses in. And Moses was the son of man. He was a prophet. He was a suffering servant. And Moses was the one that gave the instructions on the first Passover and what it pointed to and how to be underneath the blood covering. We are all called to be underneath the blood covering of Yeshua. Acts 3, verse 18 says, But those things, now this is the good news that Peter and Paul are literally preaching right after Yeshua's ascension. And look at how they incorporate all of these things from this Torah portion and the Hof Torah in this good news. They said, to the multitude, but those things which God beforehand had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has fulfilled. So he's saying, don't disregard all the prophecies just because he hasn't fulfilled all of them yet. The things about him suffering, he has fulfilled. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Yeshua, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things. That's speaking of the second coming. They're rightly dividing the word. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. So it's saying ever since Bereshit 1.1, God has been putting clues in the Torah about the coming Messiah and what he must do as the Lamb of God. For, God, for Moses truly said to, to the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you from your brethren like unto me. Him shall you listen to in all things whatsoever he shall say to you. They're quoting the prophecy in Deuteronomy in their good news message. How many people are doing that today? We need to be showing how the Old Testament prophecies are relating to this person, Yeshua, and into the new. And it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. This is amazing message that they're giving there right in Jerusalem, right after Pentecost, right after Shavuot. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and all those that follow after, as many have has spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindred and of all the earth be blessed. Unto you first God has raised up his son Yeshua. So they're relating even that prophecy to Abraham that through your seed, it's not just the descendants of Israel that the, has, the world has been blessed by. It's true that Israel has blessed the world with their knowledge. But it's through this one particular seed that they are bringing this prophecy home that the world, the whole world is blessed through the seed named Yeshua. Unto you first God has raised up his son, Yeshua, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So the whole mission of Yeshua's first coming was not to magically blot out your sin so that you can continue sinning, right? What is the definition of sin? The transgression of the Torah. It says that in his first coming, his whole purpose, the purpose of God, is to turn away every one of you from Torahlessness. That's what your iniquities are. Otherwise, on the cross, you would have magically been free from sin. You would no longer have a propensity to sin, to be selfish, self-seeking. You know, you would be living in bliss right now. 
the very fact that you have to be an overcomer through your own free will and through your own choice shows that he came to live as an example of what selfless love looks like in human form, what the living Torah looks like, where the word fell short and we couldn't see it in human form. Yeshua came and showed us, wow, this is what Torah looks like in action. Total love, total self-denial, total other-centered focus. So now we look at the parallel in the Hoff Torah, Joshua and Yeshua's second coming. We see how Yeshua's first coming was totally like Moses. Joshua was a warrior leader. He was arrayed for battle. Joshua sent forth two, not twelve this time, to Israel. There's you know, as much uh, as the Hoff Torah and the Prophets parallel Torah, whenever there's an anomaly or something different, we have to ask ourselves, why? What is it trying to tell us prophetically? And we will find out. Joshua comes with trumpeting. The very first battle he does is with trumpets to Jericho. You can kind of see where I'm going with this, right? Joshua brought whole Israel into the land where Moses could not. Look at Yeshua. Here's Joshua, arrayed in scarlet, and he's got these trumpeters announcing they're coming, and the walls are tumbling down. But well, we know at the Battle of Armageddon, Yeshua comes, and it says his vestiture is stained with blood. So he's wearing crimson, and it says that the Lord shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. So he comes with trumpeting. And the dead in Christ are raised up, and we who are alive and remain are caught up with them. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Well, Zechariah 14 talks about the same second coming, and it says he comes arrayed. He's coming to protect his people and to gather up all Israel from all the corners of the earth. It says the angels have to gather them for the, from the four corners of the earth. When they rise up at his second coming, they gather them to him. He's hovering over Jerusalem. And the very next thing, he's, the Battle of Armageddon is the sixth plague. The seventh plague, which the saints don't per receive, is called the wrath of God or the fall of Babylon. These two terms are used synonymously. So just like the fall of the walls of Jericho, you see another parallel with Yehoshua, Hamashiach, in that the walls of the cities of the nations, Revelation says, will fall. This is the seventh plague, 100 pound hail, earthquake, fire and brimstone. Yeshua, before this time period, sins too. Revelation 11 says, these are my two witnesses, and they're symbolized by two olive trees. That means they're coming from both Israel, the lost house of Israel, the ten tribes, and from Judah. Just like our symbol here of Israel, you have the two olive branches. It's interesting that there's 12 olives on each side. Israel and Judah, the two witnesses have to come through this lineage. And yet, he doesn't stop there, he says, and my two lamps. Well, there's only one menorah in the holy place. So who are the two lamps? Smyrna and Philadelphia, those that did not receive any rebuke because they've let go of all paganism in their life. They are willing to die for their faith. That's Smyrna. And Philadelphia is they're living out the Torah in love. So Yeshua also has two that he's sending to Israel before. And it says that they're to prophesy in Jerusalem for 42 months. That's the full three and a half year tribulation period leading up to his coming. And Yeshua will regather all of Israel back to the land. After the marriage of the Lamb, all of Israel is coming back. That's why some texts refer to him coming and catching up his bride or Israel. Other texts refer to him coming and all of his holy ones with him. That's after the wedding. And so you can understand the time uh, period of both of these. Beautiful symbolism of how Moses and Joshua were basically prophetic types and symbols of Yeshua's first coming and second coming. But when he comes, Luke asks, will he find faith in the earth? Will we have the faith of Rahab? Will we have the faith of Moses? Will we have the faith of Yehoshua? That no matter how big the giants are or how great the walls of the, the obstacles before us, that we can go in the name of the Lord and that we can be overcomers. And the thing that we're overcoming and the biggest battle in our lives is Torahlessness. It's selfishness. Everything boils down to, is it self-seeking? Is it self-gratifying? Is it self-exalting? Does it feed the self, self-indulgent? Or is it selfless? Because God's character is selfless. And the only way that we'll be overcomers 
is if we have faith enough to keep our eyes on Him, and by beholding, we will become changed into that same likeness of selfless love. And it'll be a natural process. It won't be burdensome. You'll look back and you'll say, when did I stop doing that? When did that habit go by the wayside? Where if you focus on yourself and all the things you don't like about yourself, you only become more like that self. And you become full of guilt and self-condemnation and hopelessness, just like the people of Jericho. But if we keep our eyes on the invisible one, the Holy One of Israel, we will be overcomers through Yeshua and His example. So with that, let's stand and close in prayer. Abba Father, we thank you for revealing yourself through your word and your word made flesh, Father. Everything in the Torah and everything in the prophets is pointing to your son, Yeshua, the future Messiah of Israel, the reigning king who did overcome, who showed us the way, not so that we can continue sinning, not so that Torah can be done away with, but so that we can learn how to live out Torah in selfless love. And that comes through self-denial and self-sacrifice, Father, just as Yeshua lived holy and completely for you and realized that his body was not his true identity, but your spirit in him. May we also have this same knowledge and recognize that you are the author and finisher of our faith. And may we keep our eyes stayed on you, Father, and may we be cleansed from all unrighteousness. As David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Because you have promised in the book of Revelation through your servant John that he who overcomes, you will give the right to eat of the tree of life. And to he who gains the victory, you will make a pillar in your temple. So, Father, this is our desire, just to be vessels for your service. Please help us to be devoid of self and to live out your selfless love in every aspect of our being, in thought, in word, and in deed, mentally, physically, spiritually, financially. We give all to you, Father, and we dedicate and rededicate our lives to you here this day so that we can be your witnesses and ambassadors, not just to Israel, but to all the nations, for you don't desire that any should be lost. So, Father, thank you for using us despite ourselves, and we just ask for your forgiveness where we fall short, and we ask for your help in keeping our eyes stayed on you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.